I just love this. You know, uh, for so many years, guys, we craved game 163. Like those days when we had an extra playoff game to determine who was going to make it in. When we saw Matt Holiday sliding head first and coming up bloodied. Uh, I thought that with the new rules we were never going to see a game 163 again. Even though these are games 161 and 162 they sure feel a lot like 163. Right. right. We had Bobby Thompson. We had Bucky Dent. These are regular season games that are being played tomorrow and you're right. We always beg for a 163 we're going to get two of them tomorrow in theory. We were talking Jeff in the last hour about hair. There is a possibility that you will have two teams having champagne celebrations in the same ballpark at the same time tomorrow in Atlanta because whoever wins game one right they could celebrate but they probably won't celebrate because you got the second game of the double header and then if the other team wins game two. They could celebrate at the same time. And meanwhile, the Diamondbacks would be just, sitting back just, rooting for a sweep. That's a, yeah, that's what they need. The Diamondbacks need a sweep by someone tomorrow. Yeah. And, and what's so interesting about this is how, do, how does each team that's playing tomorrow approach this? If they win the first game, do they just pull back on the second game? And, and how, like, or do they go knowing that this is our rival? Like the Mets and the Braves, they don't like each other. And the notion that one could end the other season in this fashion just adds a layer of intrigue to tomorrow's right. games. But I think we owe it to everyone in baseball that even if you win the first game and you're in the playoffs, you have to play the second game to win. You don't have to throw your closer or Chris your best Sale would not, if the Braves You should not game pitch one, right. Chris Sale in game two if you win game one. But you still... For the sanctity of the game, you have to play to win in game two. You just don't have to use your very best players in leverage situations. We also face the possibility of the Mets leaving Milwaukee right now to play two in Atlanta <laughs> on Monday just to go back to Milwaukee to play game one of the wild card on Tuesday. But we know this, that the Mets are headed to the postseason, and you'll see game one of the doubleheader tomorrow on ESPN2, 1 o'clock Eastern. And we talked about... The strategy here, Buster, the yeah. opportunity for the Mets tomorrow and what they might do in game one in terms of pitching. Right. So basically, uh, McGill and Severino are their two options for tomorrow. If I'm sitting in Carlos Mendoza's seat and I know Chris Sale potentially, and the Braves haven't announced their rotation, but we all think Sale's going to go in game two. If that's how the Braves are going to line it up, I'm starting Luis Severino in game one. I'm trying to get this thing over with. I'm going with a veteran. McGill has thrown well since coming back to, from the minor leagues. But I'm going with Severino one. Yeah, but isn't Severino likelier at this point to go zero for zero with Chris Sale? That's that. You know, Carlos Mendoza doesn't have a bad decision to make here. Like he's no. got he's got two guys who can go out and shut down this Atlanta lineup. Uh, I am with you. Like I'm going for the killing game one. I'm trying to get it right there. By the way, I want to I want to point out it's just gone final in Detroit. The White Sox, of all wow. teams, <laughs> have beaten the Tigers. Kansas City beating Atlanta means the Royals are locked into the five. Detroit is locked into the six. Kansas City will go to Baltimore. The Tigers will go to Houston. So Tim and I disagree with this, Jeff. You see the final out in this game. Uh, I told Tim that, yes, if I'm the Royals, I'd rather play the Orioles than I would the Astros, who've been in the American League Championship Series seven straight years. Tim feels like there's no difference. My, my point about this season is everyone is good enough. Virtually everyone is good enough to go to the World Series. Every team has a flaw. I don't think there's a real easy way to go. I don't want to play Baltimore or Houston right now. Royals, Orioles, Tigers, Astros, and we've got so much to talk about. Arizona sits back wondering if they're going to play. The Mets and Braves will play tomorrow. And again, it's this simple. If the Braves sweep tomorrow, they're in, Arizona's in. If the Mets sweep tomorrow, they're in, Arizona's in. If there's a split, the Braves and the Mets are in the postseason with Atlanta going to San Diego and the Mets headed back to Milwaukee. Aren't you guys horrified if you're the Diamondbacks right now? Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> because the only scenario in which they get in, first off, they don't control anything. They're just sitting back. They are observers at this point. And they're sitting there playing through their minds. I cannot believe we blew an 8 nothing advantage against Milwaukee last week and all of those individual games. But beyond that, you need a sweep tomorrow. And after that first game, Tim, I understand you said it, just for, like, the good of the game, you have to at least 
try, but you think a manager the day before a three-game series starts is going to use anybody of no, consequence? I said I would not use my closer. I would not use my best pitcher. I'm just I would not saying, use my setup man. I would or, not use my seventh inning guy. I would throw position players. Like, I just think you owe it to the game to play to win tomorrow without using your closer, without using your best pitcher. <laughs> so it's not a spring training game tomorrow. So you're not buying into the – I love the, uh, the baseball conspiracy theory today that if this scenario would play out the way that it's going, to tomorrow that you'd see Mendoza and Snitker go out and shake hands say we'll trade forfeits in game one and game two we're both going to play that's not going to happen it's like it's like a poker tournament right where, exactly you know, you just at the end <laughs> let's split the pot right but, but if, that, if that let me just throw this out there if that is the philosophy why not go Chris Sale in game one instead of game two because if you go with him in game one that means he can't pitch game one of the wild card series right. the, the the Braves gambit all along because Chris Sale has told them I don't care when I start you can tell me an hour before the game and I'll be ready Ready to go. Okay. So, with that in mind, their hope was they could get through, make the playoffs, and have sale available to pitch in game one. Yes. And look, the Braves are a much different team. If not only do they not have Chris Sale in game one, Buster, but if you pitch him tomorrow, you don't have him in game two and you don't have him in game three no. either. You don't have him at all in this series. And earlier this week, we were looking at like Detroit and uh, Kansas City wanted to make sure that they were clinched before Sunday because they had Tarek Skubal lined up in Detroit and they had Cole Reagans lined up. Uh, Kansas City even more so having Seth Lugo pitching only two innings yesterday. Now he's going to go in game two with Cole Reagans getting game one. Uh, I mean, the difference for the Atlanta Braves tomorrow is stark like yeah. the Mets you win one or two it's fine if you're the Braves and you don't win one it severely handicaps you going into whatever wild card series you're going to be playing and the Braves have to be carried by their pitching if they're going to make a dent in October because of all their position player injuries again the only thing I'm going to say is the Braves have to win one tomorrow if they do get swept in that doubleheader by the Mets it's Arizona that gets in and the Braves are on the outside looking in head to head Boy, it's been awfully close between these two teams. The Braves winning six, the Mets winning five. Runs scored awfully similar. Obviously, Atlanta's pitching has been better head to head. They've had the best team ERA in all of Major League Baseball this year. But what a way to go out. Games 161 and 162 on Monday. Both games on ESPN2, and Buster will be in the house for it. As long as I can get a flight to it. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and Detroit is headed to Houston. The best team over the final seven weeks of the season, despite the loss today, 31-13 and 13, since August 11th. Headed to Houston to take on an Astros team. Jeff, it feels like in some ways we've been talking about who among all of the starting options Houston has is going to pitch. And for the Tigers, it's Scoogle, and then who else is going to pitch for them in this series? I mean, it's the best team in the final six weeks of the season facing the best team of the final three months of the season. Yeah. Like the Astros have been on that run now. And, look, uh, Tarek Scoogle in game one versus Framber Valdez, are we going to get a better first-round pitching matchup than that? After that, you know, Reese Olsen back off the injured list. You've seen Cater Montero today, Casey Mize. I, I don't think it's as much about the starter once you get past Scoogle when A.J. Hinch is managing, A.J. Hinch manages playoff games yep. as if I need to get 27 outs. It's not by inning. It's not by pitcher. It's not by anything other than who is going to get me 27 outs the easiest way. And the most brilliant part of this run by the Tigers has been the management of that bullpen and how everybody from Brennan Hanafi to Tyler Holton to Bo Brisky, guys that casual fans haven't even heard of, have been absolutely brilliant at the back end. And that's why it's going to be, I think, Olsen in game two and then bullpen game in game three. And as you say, A.J. is very comfortable with this. Yep. You know, I love the look on his face when they clinched the other day. Like, oh, my God, we're in this thing. Right. So the Astros have the clear advantage in starting pitching for me in this series. But the, the Astros bullpen is great also. Yes. Hater is great. Abreu is great. Pres Presley is one of the great postseason relievers in the history of the sport. Now, Rubel Blanco, who's still really good who has pitched in relief in his career, who has closed in the Dominican in the winter, he's going to be in the bullpen also. That is a loaded bullpen. This will be a bullpen series, especially after the first night when those two left-handers are going to light it up. Doesn't it feel like, too, with A.J. Hinch going back to Houston, he's going to be like Herb Brooks standing behind the players, play your game, play your game, because they're going to be considered to be such underdogs, and they're going to feed off of that. 
the you know, the night or the day after the Tigers clinched, I got a text from AJ Hinch, and it said, "What just happened?" Yeah. <laughs> Does that not sum up the 2024 Detroit Tigers, guys? Right. Who who saw this coming? 31 and 12, the Tigers went to get themselves in it. They were 10 games out. They're going to be the fourth team ever, well, in the wild card era, to be 10 games out that late in the season and come back and make the playoffs. When I talked to Derek Schubel the other day, he said it wasn't until like two or three weeks ago that the players began to talk about the possibility that they would make the playoffs. I love how Jeff was saying the casual fan may not recognize some middle relievers. I wonder if the casual fan recognizes Kerry Carpenter and Riley Green and Matt Veerling, guys in that lineup. And and Trey Sweeney and uh, Parker Jake, Meadows yeah, in Rogers, center field. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that's the thing about this Tigers team, guys. There's no star. There just isn't. Riley Green's a really good player. Got a chance to be a star. Kerry Carpenter's a real good player. Got a chance to be a star. Tarek Skubal's going to win the Cy Young Award this year, so maybe he's going to be vaulted onto there. This is an extraordinarily young team. You look throughout that lineup, Matt Veerling is the veteran, and he's 28. <laughs> and, and when you look at the future of this team, with Jackson Job also coming up, and he's going to be a starter next year, but he is a power reliever that A.J. Hinch can turn to now. This is a team that's on the ascent, and when you look at the American League Central, that already has Cleveland in the, in the postseason, that already has Kansas City in the postseason, that already has a Minnesota Twins team that looked like it was going to be a postseason team. The Central is going to be a force to be reckoned with in the coming years. Just like Job could be used in sort of a David Price role like he was sure. in Tampa Bay as such a young player. I want to quickly mention this among star power when we talk about the Astros. For so much of the season, it was can Kyle Tucker get back and healthy again. He had a great September. What about Jordan Alvarez in this series? There's a lot of questions about his availability, and there's a lot of concern, frankly, about his ability to get back. And this is a guy who is, you know, we talk about Otani, Judge, Soto, right? Those are considered probably the three best. Jordan He's Alvarez has next. to be, if not four, then, then maybe, five. yeah. Uh, no, then maybe, like, I think he's right up there with those top three guys, Terry. Right. He is David Ortiz. Tremendous plate discipline, hits the ball all over the field. I was told it was 70-30, 70 positive, that he would play on Tuesday. But that was two days ago I was told that. He didn't even make the trip. He's got swelling. We'll see where it goes. But they obviously have to have him if they're going to make the run. Okay, a little breaking news here. Confirmation. Braves are going to go Schwellenbach in game one. They're going to go Chris Sale in game two. Wow. Regardless the outcome of game one, it'll be that, Sale in game two. Regardless. Well, that's the schedule. And I would imagine if they win with Schwellenbach in game <laughs> one, Sale's not Sale game is not two. pitching in game two. Yeah. Um, one other point to make on the Detroit-Houston series. I guess there's a lot of people saying, boy, you don't want to face the Astros. Maybe you don't want to face the Tigers, the best team in baseball over the past seven weeks. All right, it's set. Baltimore. And Kansas City in Oriole Park in Camden Yards. Baltimore won four of six meetings with the Royals this season. But, and there is a big but, both of those series were played way back in April where each of these teams looked very, very differently here. And Tim, I am struck in the first blush of this series by the mega young star power that we're going to see between these two teams. Yeah, how about the two shortstops playing in this game? Bobby Witt Jr., who's going to be the first... Kansas City Royal to finish in the top two of the MVP voting since George Bratton in 1985. I talked to a couple of Royals the other day and they told me I've never seen a better player than Bobby Witt Jr. And then there's Gunnar Henderson, who's the best player on the Orioles. He's going to be in the top 10 of the MVP for the second year in a row. And again, this is where the game is. It's being led by two guys like this. And it's so beautiful that these two teams played each other to start the season. And now they're going to be playing each other to start the postseason. I just love that the future is now that these guys get to go head to head that remember the last time the Baltimore Orioles and the Kansas City Royals played in the playoffs the Royals went out and swept them and it was surprising too because you know the the notion that this Royals team back getting to the World Series for the first time in three decades um, this is the start Kansas City hopes of a very similar evolution and Baltimore, on the other hand, this is where the Orioles have wanted to get since this rebuild began, Buster. Yeah, and it's pretty rare that you have a small market team that can put together the sort of experience that the Royals are going to roll out there with a rotation, right? Usually small market teams have one or two spots. 
you throw in a lot of bullpen help, but to have Reagans and Lugo and Waka in one, two, three, that's impressive, especially with the Royals following their investment last winter. That, that's right. It, you know why they have this rotation? Because they went out and, and spent, spent money. money. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness, what a novel concept. And look, J.J. Piccolo, the general manager, deserves a lot of credit. Not just for getting those two guys in this offseason, but let's remember how they got Cole Reagans. They traded a role to Chapman last May, much earlier than you typically see relievers. Exactly. Made. And credit, too, to John Sherman, the Kansas City Royals owner. Not only did he spend $100-plus million on free agents this offseason, but he gave Bobby Witt the $287 million contract extension, locked in a top three player in baseball for the long term, and gave Kansas City a franchise cornerstone around whom it can build. Right, and we all know the Orioles are in trouble with their starting pitching with Grayson Rodriguez not coming back and they thought they were going to get him back. They're down to Corbin Burns who can beat anyone as we know and Zach Eflin has been really good one of the great pickups at the trade deadline after that you know Dean Kramer will you know bullpen is a little shaky I'm telling you offensively they're a slightly different team now since Jordan Westberg came back it's one of the most underrated players in the game never gives up an at bat great two strike hitter and you put him in and play him at second base every day which is what's happened so far I think they're a dangerous team offensively. they need heroes to emerge from their everyday lineup right and, and, and can Adley Rutschman pick things up after what's been a poor second half. A lot remains to be seen here. All right, Buster, big stuff tomorrow in Atlanta, a doubleheader. Yeah, it looks like the Mets uh, could go with Tyler McGill in game one. It seems to be the direction that they might be headed. And Luis Severino in game two. Schwellenbach and Sale lined up for the Braves. But the funny thing about that game two matchup that we have listed there, it's never going to happen <laughs> because whoever wins game one is going to pull back their game two starter, Kev. All right, so McGill and Schwellenbach in game one, and for as good as the Mets pitching has been, Jeff, that would seem to be a major advantage for Atlanta in game one. Oh, absolutely. Schwellenbach's been awesome, and awesome for a couple of months now. And I had, I had an evaluator reach out to me earlier this week and say, hey, you know Spencer Schwellenbach is every bit as good as the guys at the top of the rotation. And I was like, sale? And he's like, yes. The stuff is there. The compete is there. This is a guy who really didn't start until he went into the Braves organization, played shortstop in college. But what the Braves do extraordinarily well is develop athletes. And whether it's a guy like Owen Murphy, who they've had down in the minor leagues now, or J.R. Ritchie, uh, Schwellenbach is like the first one from that generation of athletes to come up. And there are going to be more coming from the Braves system in future years. And one thing I would say, McGill has pitched much better since being called back from the minor leagues. They had him develop pitching plans, and he worked on that sinker, altered the grip. He's a different pitcher. We, we've never seen anything quite like what we're going to see tomorrow. It's awesome. Just imagine being the Toronto Blue Jays, I mean the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks, sitting around waiting like it's the Final Four or it's the NCAA tournament. Are we in or are we out? And they need a sweep. They need either the Mets to sweep or the Braves to sweep for them to get in. We could have two champagne celebrations by two different teams in the same spot at the exact same time depending on how this plays out because as we've talked about if you're the Mets and you win game one you know what you might just hold back a little bit wait till after game two to celebrate and if the Braves were to win game two they could be both celebrating simultaneously. Buster's going to be there both games on ESPN2 and again Tim ran through it the scenarios are this simple if the Braves sweep the doubleheader they're in as the five seed. Arizona is the six seed. If the Mets sweep the doubleheader, the Mets are the five seed. Arizona is the six seed. If the team split the doubleheader tomorrow, the Braves and Mets are in, and the Braves have the tie break. Uh, tie break. Jeff, who gets in? I think it's going to be the Braves and the Mets, though. For anyone out there saying, let's do the double forfeit thing, both managers go and shake hands and say, <laughs> you get one, we get the other. This is the Atlanta Braves and the New York Mets, guys. They don't like each other. And imagine being the Mets getting revenge on the Braves for all of the late season trouble that they've given them. Yeah, I think they're going to split the doubleheader. Me too. And that's all I was trying to say is we need to have respect for the game and play both games the proper way to do it. And that's why I think there will be a split tomorrow and both teams will make the playoffs. Just do it the Skip Schumacher way. 
You know, when Shohei Otani was going off in that game where he hit 50-50, Schumacher said, I'm not going to pitch around him. Let's go challenge him. Go challenge each other. Play baseball that is going to be remembered yeah, for it a to the long game. time. I think yes. it's amazing at the start of the season the fact that the Mets are playing to play their way into the playoffs. And given everything Atlanta's endured, that they're playing to play their way into the postseason.